Hello everyone and welcome to my channel this is the 70th part of what if Deku had a robot wolf I hope you enjoy link to the original story and author in the description. Chapter 70, Hybrid That night, the students at the camp took part in a test of courage. It was UA versus CI. With the UA students trying to scare the CI girls. Two of CI students, one with orange, tentacle-like hair with glasses over her eyes, the other had short, cyan hair, were walking through the forest path. Neither of them had been impressed by the UA students' attempts at scaring them. The orange-haired girl, Saya, sighed as they walked. I wasn't expecting much from a group of first years, but this is ridiculous. Nothing they do is scary. The cyan-haired girl, Itoka, nodded. Agreed. Everything they've done so far is so basic. I've seen bad horror movies with better scares than that. I will admit, I was slightly scared of that thing they did with Dark Shadow, Saya said. And the attempt to mind control us almost worked. But, the majority of their scare attempts so far are just bad. Seems like even the best fail at some things, Itoka said with a smile. I don't think there's anything those UA first years can do to scare us. Are you sure about that? Saya asked. Positive, Itoka said. What's the worst that can happen? It's just that, Shifuyu and Tamayo, they ran past us earlier looking scared out of their mind, Saya said with a frown. They didn't even stop to tell us what scared them. But, they looked horrified. The UA students they encountered probably just got lucky with them, Itoka said. I hope you're right, Sada said, looking ahead of them. In any case, case, we shouldn't underestimate them dash. What the? The two girls stopped. On the path, before them lay a girl with ashburn hair, sprawled out on the ground surrounded and covered in blood. Eyes wide open staring at them with an unblinking, unmoving stare. Is that the girl who punched Katsuragi? Itoka asked. It is, Saya replied before she walked over to the girl. Do they really think playing dead and covering themselves with fake blood is going to scare us? Please. Like that wow dash she said before she paused, looking down in horror. The other girl wasn't breathing, and that wasn't fake blood. It was real. Saya started to shiver in fear, stepping back from the corpse in front of her. As in, a real dead body. They weren't faking this, this was real, someone had killed her. Saya, what's wrong? Itoka asked. SS she's dead. Saya replied, her body shaking with fear. What? Itoka gasped. The other girl was dead. How? This was supposed to be a game, so who killed her? The two CI girls stared in shock at the body before them. Did a villain find the camp and do this to her? They noticed a trail of blood leading away from the body, starting from the girl's neck and leading into the forest. The two slowly followed the trail with their eyes, following it to its end and finding a horrifying sight. The fluffy green-haired girl who won the UA Sports Festival was pinned to a tree, a pair of knives pinning her hands to it. There was someone pressing her against it, that red-haired girl with buns in her hair. She was pinning the other girl to the tree and biting her neck. The green-haired girl looked to be in pain, mouth wide open but unable to scream. WWW what's going on? Itoka gasped, shaking with fear. Aren't they classmates? Why is she doing this? Maybe she snapped. Saya gasped. I've heard of people whose quirks give them cravings for something snapping if they don't consume it. The red-haired girl stopped biting the other girl. She then slowly turned her head towards them, a blood-covered smile on her face. Itoka and Saya screamed loudly before running off the way they came. The corpse of Achiko watched them as they ran. The body remained motionless, long after the two CI girls had run off. The body suddenly blinked, smiled, and began to laugh. With Himiko and Izumi joining in as well. Durandal walked out of his hiding spot in the forest, joining in on the laughter as well. He had recorded the entire thing. Man we got those two good as well, he laughed. We're four for four on the number of CI students scared off by us. We sure are, Himiko laughed as she got off of Azumi, 
allowing the other girl to move away from the tree. Her hands not really pinned to it. This is fun. Man, this was such a good idea, Izumi said with a smile as she checked the fake knives attached to her hands. She was so glad she had asked Momo for these, they made this scare look so much more realistic. As did the blood. Good thing they brought plenty of blood bags for Himiko. Achiko giggled as she sat up. Man, I am so glad I agreed to this plan. Just seeing the realization on those girls' faces when they realize I'm dead is just so worth it. Himiko smiled. Yep. They thought they were ready for us. Rule number one of being a hero, don't underestimate your opponent. Shame about the blood though. I could have drank that. You can drink our blood, Izumi said. It's as we said, you can have our blood whenever you like. We're friends after all. Himiko smiled. Thanks for that. I'll. Are you okay, Izumi? I didn't take too much blood? No, I don't think you took anything either, Izumi said, scratching the bite mark on her neck. I'm surprised you can bite someone and not drink any blood. Oh that, that's easy, Himiko said with a smirk, I just bite, but don't suck. Just make sure you don't suck anything else, Achiko pouted. Whilst she did agree to this, she really didn't like the idea of Izumi being the one she's actively biting. Oh, are you jealous over there, Achiko? Himiko asked with a grin. Do you want to be the one I'm biting? Can't. I'm the only one who can trick the others into thinking that I'm dead, Achiko said, shaking her head. I have to be close to them to affect their perception. I can't do that for Izumi if I'm the one Himiko's pinning to a tree. Oh, you have no idea how much I really want to do that to you, Himiko thought, licking her lips. Shame this won't work on rolls, Achiko continued. Her abilities are just so much stronger than mine. I'm surprised how quickly your powers have been improving since we got here, Durandal remarked as he walked up beside her. So am I, Achiko said, looking at her hands. Who knew meditating would help me improve them so quickly? Sometimes it's the simplest things that can help a person's quirk to improve, Izumi said. Just that one little detail that you're missing to put everything together. Oftentimes those with mental quirks need to meditate to help improve them. Finding inner peace can sometimes be better to improve one's quirk than say, brute force training. Yeah, that's what Roll said, Achiko said. You think meditating would help for me? Himiko asked. I know I may struggle with it since it's not exactly my kind of thing. And my telepathy is kind of different from yours. Well, you won't know until you try, Izumi said with a smile. Heads up, more people incoming, Durandal warned. Places. Achiko said before she went back to playing dead. Izumi and Himiko quickly went back to their little scene against the tree whilst Durandal went back to hide. By the time, time the test of courage was over, only six CI girls managed to pass their little vampire terror. Rolls and her partner of course managed to make it past them, as did Psycho and her partner. The last two who made it past were an odd pair. One of them failed to even see them due to her glasses being broken earlier in the challenge, and the other was turned on by the fake gruesome scene. Apparently, there are people out there who are into that sort of thing. Achiko was at least glad that the boo groping girl was one of those who ran away scared. A little bit of revenge felt nice. Kiroka Hasaki, better known as Slice, smiled as she made her way back to the apartment she was hiding out in at the moment. Using back alleys to avoid staying on the streets as much as possible. She was honestly happy right now. An old friend of hers had been found. Okay so she had forgotten everything from before she got backstabbed by that Greek arsehole, who she was going to help her friend kill, but, she just so happened to have the resources to help her remember and piece everything together. Her friend was currently resting back at the apartment. She just slipped out for a bit to stock up on a few things. Barrows may have fainted a bit after seeing the toy she stole. But she should be fine after a few hours of sleep. She may have realized a bit too late that said memory loss included everything Atsuo had told her about all the important things, like why her species was even bothering with this very out-of-the-way planet, what a dreadnought is, and why it is important that the hybrids are kept hidden. 
looking at you Galastram. Seriously, who the fuck approved that? Weren't hybrids who were approved to go into this world's heroics industry supposed to have their hero names approved ahead of time? So who the fuck approved Galastram? She would have a word with who's in charge of looking after hybrids like her if she, well, was allowed to see the guy that is. The imps don't really like her going up to their ships, especially after she sneaked aboard the key ship. She was, she was a bit of a troublemaker, after all. Stop right there. A female voice shouted out to her from behind. Case in point, she was wanted by the heroes for a few minor things. Like destroying two trains and killing a few raft personnel, among other small things. Karuka turned around and saw the pro hero clairvoyance standing at the end of the alleyway hand resting on the butt of her pulse gun. Clairvoyance, Karuka said as she turned to face the hero. What brings one of Ophion's best heroes to Japan? That's none of your business, villain, Claire replied, her hand curling around the grip of her weapon, finger off the trigger. Karuka smirked. Villain. What makes you think I'm a villain? Slice, please, no games tonight, Claire said with a tired sigh. We've been through this song and dance enough to know the playing I'm not a villain card is not going to work. I've been over your numerous crimes oh so many times, and I'm really getting annoyed by how much you keep adding to them, she said before she pulled out her gun and aimed it at Karoka. Oh, am I causing you problems? Karoka mocked as her hair solidified into blades. What you going to do about it, hero? Cuff me? If it'll stop you from causing me problems, yes. Claire replied with a determined look on her face. Well then, hero, Karuka smirked before she unfurled the claws from her gloves. I'd like to see you try. Panting, that's what she heard, panting. She was panting, running after a young girl with long, well cared for hair through a forest wearing what looked like pajamas. Come on Barrows, the girl she was following said. Karuka. She said as she followed her. How many times do I have to tell you not to use that nickname? My name's Belterus. I know, the red-haired girl said as she turned back towards her and smiled, her blue sapphire eyes glinting in the darkness around them. It's just Rush. Belterus, Belterus sighed but kept following her. Why are we even up so late? I saw Atsuo walk out of the house earlier, Karuka replied. So? Belterus said as she continued to follow her friend. Papa sometimes heads out into the forest for a walk late at night. This time? He was carrying his special cane, Karoka said. You know, the one he uses, a dreadnought. Belterus blinked. Papa's awesome stick? But, why would he be heading out to meet with a dreadnought out in the forest? Why not inside the house? I don't know, Karuka replied. That's why I want to see what he's doing. Aren't you curious as well? I am, Belterus said. But, should we be doing this? You know Papa's meetings with dreadnoughts are supposed to be private. I know, Karoka said. But aren't you the slightest bit curious as to why they're having a meeting out in the woods so late at night? Well, sort of dash, Belterus said before she tripped over a tree root. She gasped as she fell, only to stop when she felt herself get grabbed by something, some kind of invisible force. She looked up towards Karuka. The other girl was holding a hand out towards her. You okay? She asked. I am, Belterus replied as she stood back up. You've gotten better with your telekinesis. Karuka nodded before her hair moved slightly, would have been easier if I used my hair. It's so much easier, my heretic given powers. Hey, didn't Papa tell you never to call them that? Belterus said with a frown. Your dad may have been a heretic, but that doesn't make you or your powers. The two ki kids kept running until they came across a clearing with two people standing in the middle of it. One of them was an old man wearing rather funky looking clothing and resting on an ornate cane. He had messy ginger hair and a large, puffy mustache, and his eyes were closed. The other figure wore dark, sinister, and highly advanced armor. The armor looked sturdy, with armored plates over a bodysuit, colored a mix of dark purple and dark red. Armored gauntlets with claws at the end of each finger, a form-fitting helmet that was the image of fear itself, 
a dark black floor-length combat skirt, and heavy-duty boots. The figure's right hand was also different, a skeletal metal hand that looked sharp. You're sure it's safe now? Atsuo asked, a concerned look on his face. I am positive, master, the armored figure replied, his voice deep and menacing. The heretics who found out about this place have been eliminated. They will be of no threat to the hybrids. Thank mother. That's good to hear, Atsuo said with a relieved sigh. I am glad to hear place has yet to be compromised. I dread to think what would happen if a heretic got their hands on one of those children. They've already suffered enough. Fools they may be, but they are dangerous fools, the armored figure said. They defy mother's will, and follow a path she herself has told us not to follow. Yes yes, I am quite aware of how dangerous the heretics are, Sarada, Atsuo said with a frown. I was out fighting born. And no more of this master nonsense. I'm retired. My apologies, master, the figure, Sarada, replied. But didn't you always tell me to respect your elders? That I did, Atsuo said before he poked his old apprentice in the chest with his cane. I also told you to respect my retirement plan, which includes dropping the whole master thing. You're a, a student, he said before he looked down at Sarada's skeletal hand. I see your fight with the heretic Lord Neb Neberk cost you more than. Sarada nodded before he raised his prosthetic hand and flexed his fingers. My arm wasn't all I lost in that battle. I don't even know how much of my soul is left. You should have retreated with the rest of the first wave, Atsuo said. No one should have been around that man time. I'm sorry master, but I could not bring myself to disengage, Sarada said. I had to see the battle through. I had to see him die with my own two eyes. That kind of attitude almost got you killed, your very soul, consumed by something truly abnormal, Atsuo said with a frown. Not something allowed to happen. You are a dreadnought, an instrument of will. You shouldn't be risking your soul like that. Wouldn't you agree, Belterus, Karuka? The two young girls shrieked when Atsuo turned towards them, neither of them expecting him to notice them. But then again, they should have expected this, he was a powerful telepath after all. Sarada sighed. Trust the troublemakers to sneak out at night to spy on a secret meeting. I'm sorry, Papa, Belterus said, tears pooling around her and Karuka's eyes. We didn't mean to spy on you. It's all right, Belterus, I'm not mad, Atsuo said with a warm smile. You two were just curious. I understand that for better of you but sometimes curiosity can be a dangerous thing. It can lead you to dangerous places and down paths best left alone. The two young girls nodded. Atsuo was an old man and had a large amount of wisdom to share with those younger than him. House. It's late, and you two should really get to bed, Atsuo said before he walked over to the two girls and ushered them back to the house. Also, I don't know how much you heard. I'd prefer it if you didn't tell anyone about what you, you heard here. I don't want to cause any unwanted panic. Don't worry, we won't, Belterus said with a nod. Will the heretics ever find this place? Karuka asked, shuddering with fear. Please, if one of them finds this place, I will make them live to regret it, Atsuo said with a friendly smile. I promise you, I will protect every single one of you. I may be an old man but I can still deal with minor problems that pop up from time. Veros slowly opened her eyes. Was that a dream or a memory? It felt like a dream, but the way it acted out felt more vivid and real. Like she had lived through that personally. Okay, so she was slightly annoyed that it ended abruptly like that. There were also gaps and random jumps from time to time. They were annoying, but probably something she should have expected. Looking through that photo album must have triggered something, helping her to remember what was lost. But it's incomplete, with bits missing here and there. Her brain was like a jigsaw puzzle with several bits missing. Not everything is there, so it's putting what it can back together, and skipping over what it can't recover. Daltaras. Was that her name? Ha, huh, looked like Barrows was nothing more than a nickname. She always wondered why that was her name guess she finally found out. 
But, if that was a memory, then that would mean she not only knew a dreadnought but also knew why they were here. But that would mean that she already had the answers she needed, she just needed to remember them. She looked around first. She was on a bed. Guess Slice must have carried her here. There was a bedside table with a note on it. She picked it up and looked at it. Gone to, to get food. Slice. Well, looks like she knows where her friend is. She sat up on the bed, sighed, and contemplated the memory she saw. Okay brain, think. It was only a small memory and a lot of it didn't make sense, but what did I see exactly? That Karuka girl clearly had the same powers as those who took over Hummer eyes, but she acted like a friend to me and seemed scared of her powers, so she's probably not aligned with them. Atsua was talking to some Darth Vader-like guy named Sarada, and, if what I heard was right, both of them were dreadnoughts. Okay, so Papa was a retired dreadnought. That's surprising. But then, if he was one, how did Argonaut manage to kill him? They also used the term heretic, saying that they go against mother's will and follow a path she herself told them not to. Karoka even called her non-court powers heretical. So if we use the proper term and not the 40k term, heretics are those who worship the same god but do so in a way that is seen as heretical by the main group. Guess the soul-eating part isn't something their mother approves of. They also used the term hybrid. Karuka was clearly one of them. But, what are they a hybrid of, Atlanteans? She shook her head, she can ask Slice more about this when she gets back. All she knew was that the usurpers had to be stopped. If she wasn't so scared of getting killed by the bastards then she'd have gone and killed them herself. Not much she could do about it if they could just stop her arrows before they even hit them. Oh, right, Slice had that toy of hers. That could help in killing the fucker. Now all she needed to do was somehow convince her friend, who may also have powers like those hybrids, she will be talking to her about that as well, to send it against the guy. She got up and went to get some water. Just what the fuck had she got gotten herself into? At least she had answers to some of her questions, even if they did raise so many more. The door to the apartment suddenly opened and closed just as quickly as it was opened. Barrows turned towards the door and saw a rather strange and confusing sight. Slice was being pinned to a wall, her hands handcuffed behind her back, and was fiercely making out with clairvoyance. Slice's hair wrapped around Claire's body in an erotic way. Pardon? Are the cuffs really necessary? Slice asked as the two made out, the buttons on her blouse having been undone, revealing her deep red lace bra. You are the one who asked to be cuffed, villain Claire Voyance replied. Her white dress shirt was also undone, revealing her white lace bra. Fair, Slice cooed. Still mad that, you cheated to get, them on me. Please girl, like you weren't, planning the same clairvoyance cood. I felt those, psychic hands of yours, all over me. Like you weren't, doing the same. I thought you, were a serious woman? Only, when on duty. Fair. Barrows just stood there, watching in shock as the two women, both of whom were on opposite sides of the law, made out in front of her. Wasn't clairvoyance a hero? Why was she making out with a villain? Or was this some deep cover shit no one told her about? Her list of questions that needed answering just doubled in size. The two women continued their passionate makeout session for a few more moments before they finally noticed that they were being watched. Hi, Barrows said, raising her good hand. Clairvoyance leaned away from Slice with a confused look on her face. Oh, so this is where you ended up. Damn, Slice breathed. I was hoping you'd still be asleep. Yeah, sorry about that, Barrow said, a shocked look still on her face. I have, so many questions right now. You don't even know just how many I have. Especially, since I think I remember a bit more about my past now. You're star starting to remember? Slice asked with a smile. Remember anything important? Oh, nothing big, Barrows replied. That my name is Belterus. Plus something about heretics, hybrids, psychic powers, and that Atsua was a retired dreadnought. The other two women blinked a few times before they rapidly fixed their uniforms, the cuffs around Slice's hands falling to the ground. 
Why the fuck didn't you start off with that? That is fucking important shit. Wait, you know her? Claire asked as they walked over to Barrows. Of course I do, she's Belterous, Slice replied as she picked up Barrows with her hair. You know, the friend from Camp New Haven. She's Belterous? Claire said, sounding surprised. Why didn't you tell me? I could have sent her your way if I knew she was Atsuo's daughter. I didn't know, Slice said with a shrug as she put Barrows down on a chair before she and Claire sat down on the sofa. Now then, Belterous, start from the beginning. What have you learned? Barrows raised a finger. First thing first, why are you two friends? Aren't you two supposed to be, I don't know, fighting in a non-sexual way? Ah, about that, Slice said, raising a hand before she was interrupted by Claire. Technically, despite being on opposite sides of the law, your friend here and I are on the same side. But it's complicated. Try me, Barrows said calmly. Claire opened her mouth to speak but was cut off by Slice. We're human-alien hybrids of a species called Semitics, who are all natural telepaths whose abilities aren't linked to quirks. The people who took over Hummerize are what we call heretics, psychic soul-eating monsters who use psychic abilities so devastatingly horrific that even our mother, who is basically a god but doesn't like to be called one, told us not to use them. They just use them anyway. Claire and I are basically, basically working with the same group of people to ensure that these heretics don't complete their goals. Barrows looked at the two women with a blank, unsurprised look on her face. Huh, so that's why you called your non-court powers heretic given powers, she remarked. You must have really hated them back then. Slice chucked. Yep, you're definitely starting to remember now. And yes, I do hate them since my arsehole of a sperm donor was one of them. That's it? Claire said looking confused. That's all you can say after being told that? You've just been told that aliens are real and that we are hybrids, and yet you are shockingly calm about it. To be honest, I was expecting something stranger, like an ancient conspiracy kept hidden across generations where these psychic powers came from Atlantis, Barrows replied calmly. Really she felt she should be more shocked by this news, but she wasn't. It was probably because she had already been told this and being told it again was helping her to remember. Aliens being responsible is just so much simpler than the mess I thought it was going to be. But then again, my brain is already a mess with that shrapnel inside of it. As is my life. Aliens being involved in this shit was the only logical way this could get any weirder. Also, it explains that big robot of yours. Wait, what big robot? Claire asked, turning towards Slice. Slice looked away sheepishly. Oh, just a little something I took from those raft guys. That may have been given to them by a heretic. Claire sighed. Only you would refrain from handing in an alien combat mech. What, I want to have a little bit of fun with it before I hand it in, Slice replied with a shrug. Claire groaned. Why haven't I arrested you yet? Because we need people on both sides of the law to track down heretics, Slice replied. The Dreadnought can't do it all by themselves. So, you two work for these Dreadnought guys then, Barrow said before looking at Claire. Aren't you supposed to be hunting them down or something? I am, Claire replied. I'm only doing it so that they don't get complacent. I may be a hybrid, but I'm not part of their operations here, nor was one of my parents a heretic so I'm not as restricted by what I can do like your friend here. I, like my younger sister, wanted to be a hero because, despite only being half-human, this world is my home, and I want to protect it. By being in charge of the WHA's dreadnought case I can ensure the dreadnoughts take operations here seriously. With the stakes so high, they can't afford to take things lightly. Barrows nodded. That sort of made sense. If these guys were out there doing whatever they were doing, they probably did not need the hassle that exposure would bring. It would cause all kinds of chaos if the existence of aliens was revealed. It also didn't take a genius to realize that these dreadnoughts were hunting these heretics. Okay, I think I'm getting a better idea of what's going on, and what Atsuo was involved in, Barrows said. What about the hybrids? Why do these heretics want to make more of them? Do they want to make an enhanced army of hybrids or something? 
or something, Slice replied. They want to make more hybrids, but they don't want to make an army. Heretics are more likely to devour each other than work together. No, they want to make hosts. There's a power we call soul transfer that allows them to transfer their mind and soul into a new body, Claire added. When the old body is nearing its limits they just transfer to a new, younger one. It allows them to live far longer than their nat natural lifespan. Because of this, it's one of the seven forbidden techniques mother told us never to use. God, Barrows gasped. That just made these guys so much more terrifying. How are you supposed to fight someone who can just swap to a new body? Why? Why do something so horrifying? Because heretics only want one thing, more power, Slice explained. By living longer, they can get stronger. They are greedy bastards, only wanting to become stronger as quickly as possible. Quirks can give them more power easily. The only reason why they are bothering with making hybrids is because a regular human body can't hold the mind and soul of a Semitic. It'll burn up in a matter of days, and severely weaken their psychic powers. A hybrid would solve that problem, a quirked human with a body that won't burn up within days of transferring into it. Fucking hell that's messed up, Barrows gasped. She felt sick, very sick. Pretending to love someone just so they could unwittingly aid them in making a hybrid child they could use as a host. It felt far too close to home for her liking. She was, after all, on the receiving end of something similar. Did these people just not care about the lives they were destroying? Okay, so she wasn't the best person to ask that question since she was part of an organization that wanted to kill millions of people. But that's the thing, Hummerize wanted to just kill quirked people to save mankind, these heretics wanted to make compatible bodies for them to use. Her eyes suddenly widened. Wait, all those kids at that camp. Were all heretic born, like me, Slice finished. Children born from a union of a quirked human and semitic heretic. Made for the sole purpose of being an acceptable host for their heretic parent. Thankfully the dreadnoughts have prevented the heretics from ever switching to a fully developed hybrid. They need an adult mind to switch with, a child's mind isn't developed enough to accept an adult mind. Barrows nodded, not at all liking what she was hearing. How could these people do such a thing? It's like a worse version of a quirk marriage. At least they were all stopped before they could succeed. What about Hummer Eyes? She asked. Ever played SCOM 2? Claire asked. Well, major spoiler, but the aliens wanted to melt down humans and extract their genetic material to a custom-made hybrid body for their leaders to use. The guys who took over Hummer Eyes want to do the same. They can't exactly leave Earth with hundreds of humans, so they are melting as many as they can down into genetic material and shipping that off-world. Barrows gagged, now she really felt sick, and somewhat relieved. Yes, it's still messed up, killing all those people just for their genetic material. But at least it wasn't as bad as she thought it was going to be. Okay, that explains a few things, Barrows said, just managing to stop herself from throwing up. This conversation was going to give her nightmares. But, there is one thing I still want to know. Just what is a dreadnought? That will be it for this part. I hope everyone enjoyed if you did please leave a like and comment if you want part 71. If you want to hear more from me subscribe I hope to see you all in the next one.